those elected were candidates of the bloc of the communists and the non-party people. Stalin was elected first deputy to Supreme Soviets of all the Union and Autonomous Republics. The people greeted their representatives with a grand demonstration. The elections demonstrated the unity of the Soviet people, their invincible moral strength, and the political might of the USSR. Terror was critical for the Soviet system in sustaining the gap between reality and the lofty utopian claims that the system made. How long can you sustain belief in utopian goals that the population was showered and bombarded with? At a certain point, this gap between what the Soviets were claiming to do and what they were actually achieving were about to expand and the gap would be unbridgeable. After months of traveling packed in cattle cars, we arrived in Siberia. It was raining very hard. Buyers were arriving, but we were being sold only by the wagon load. So the contractors couldn't pick and choose. They had to buy the whole group of us. But no one wanted a train load of women and little children. So it was two weeks before a company in the Altai region bought us to cut trees. Then we had to walk another eight days into the mountains. At night, we just sat in the cold with no protection. I was still wearing the same summer dress and sandals. All of us were still wearing the same things we had on when we were arrested. A year later, when the work in the forest was done, we were herded into cattle cars for another miserable two-month trip, this time to the Lena River. There they forced us onto barges. It was a long trip down the Lena River toward a part of the Arctic Ocean called the Laptev Sea. We were dumped off on desolate, empty islands, thousands of us. Frozen earth. Nothing grew there. Very rough KGB commanders with rifles organized us into work brigades. My brother Romus decided to work in the fishing brigade because they promised him extra food. It was dangerous work. They had to wade into the water among the ice flow, and in August the water was already freezing. He was still wearing his high school shirt and pants, all torn to pieces by a year of cruel labor. But Father had said that Romas was to provide food for us, and he was determined to get us food, as Father had said. Mother died later that winter. But I think I am alive today because of Romas's work. I was in the children's brigade, and we pulled logs out of the water. We were all under 13 years old. Everyone had to work in order to get food coupons, and you needed coupons to eat. We worked 12 or 13 hours a day, and if they said more, we had to work more, seven days a week. After one week of terrible work, I was paid three rubles in coupons, not even enough for a loaf of bread. I sat on the shore and cried all by myself after that. I wanted to help my family so much, but I couldn't even earn a loaf of bread. It was very hard work, especially when the snow started in September. Frozen sludge covered the water. Our clothes began to ice over, and we still didn't have huts to live in. After I was sentenced 25 years of hard labor, I was shipped off to the Urals, to a slave labor camp. All political prisoners had to perform the absolutely hardest labor, forestry, mining, construction. It was dangerous and unsafe. On top of the hard work, there was very little food and we were starving. Many prisoners died, huge numbers starved to death. And this was by plan. It was a kind of torture. 
Sometimes they would have us do work that was entirely pointless. But we had been labeled enemies of the people, and the enemies of the people had to be liquidated, that is, eliminated. That was the official line, and they were quite open about it. The prison camp where I was located wasn't a big one, about 3,000 people. But camps like these were spread out all over the entire USSR. So in actuality, millions of people were incarcerated as political prisoners at this time. In fact, there were tens of thousands of these slave labor camps all over Russia, even as far east as the Magadan region. I was a political prisoner because I was struggling for my nation's freedom, which is the highest political goal. But I was reduced to the position of being a slave. None of us had any rights. We had absolutely no rights, none of the basic rights that are granted to prisoners in other countries. But that was all part of their plan. After my arrest in 1957, there was an official trial. And I was sentenced to four years of hard labor in a concentration camp. They transported me to a lager in a region in Siberia and a special cattle car for prisoners called a Stalipin. I also spent time in a prison in Vilnius before they shipped all of us to the Gulag. I was in Siberia three years, but the majority of Lithuanian prisoners were there for 15 to 25 years. And it was almost embarrassing for me, since they would kid me that I had a child sentence compared to them. During my months of questioning, they threatened to pack me off to a psychiatric hospital where I would face the same fate as my neighbor, the poet that I told you about. Being in a psychiatric hospital was a hundred times worse than being in this prison. But even this prison was terrible, and during my time in this cell, I became very sick. My hair fell out. I lost over 40 pounds. My own brother didn't recognize me. It got to the point where I couldn't even walk. They had to carry me out of the cell. Later on, I found out the guards had placed two x-rays in the little room next to my cell, aimed right at me, and had used them on me. <laughs> 